Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and poisoning cases from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 20. Who'd have thought we would make it this far? Woohoo! I know, it's mad. <laughs> 20 episodes we've done this. Ah. Oh, I'm glad we got to 20 and people still want to hear us. Well. What do you mean, well? Well, I mean, people have, have not said they don't. So. <laughs> Wow, the passive-aggressive world that you live in. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> I'm a glass half full type of chap. <laughs> so, yeah, everyone's out there quietly hating us, but not telling us because they want us to fail horribly, obviously. <laughs> um, but, yay, 20 episodes. Thank you to all of our lovely fans and all of the very loyal people who have followed us, who have been sharing us and tweeting about us and sending us cocktail pictures and ideas. You are all very beautiful, wonderful, beautiful, delightfully deadly people and entirely insane for sticking with us this long Yay! <laughs> but we love you. you but yes and enlist more people <laughs> <laughs> go out on mass exactly this is what we command you through your headphones <laughs> recruit minions for the poisoners cabinet find more people bring them to us well bring them to a podcast subscription <laughs> service of your choice what, what, what was that word you were trying to say there? I don't know. I was trying <laughs> to think... Well, subscription. subscription. Well, I was trying services. to think of what, what you call a, a podcast service. I was just going a subscription service. Where you, wherever yeah. you get your podcast, that, bring that, them to that. that. How are you, Nick? <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> fine. I mean, I mean, after that, I mean, who can beat that? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's been it's been a brilliant introduction so far to episode 20. <laughs> Anyone who's listened to this for the first time, this is much the pattern as it's, as it's always been. Nick just being a bitch to me <laughs> and me trying, trying to carry on, hoping one week here the cruelty will end. <laughs> you haven't learned by now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were going like say the masochism last week. I think this is... <laughs> I really am starting to identify <laughs> with key people in that. Not the Marquis de Sade. We've learnt a lot about poisons over the last 20 episodes. We have. And poisoners and, and what you should do and what you should never do. Uh, but I've not learned that you'll never appreciate me as a human being. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a tad harsh, I feel. I know, I was trying to think of something funny. But actually, you know what? The truth came out, Nick. <laughs> No, you're lovely. Yay for me. I started to feel a bit unwell like 10 minutes before we started recording and I think it's now seeping into the brain. The belching that there was before the oh, recording started. No it one was, needs to know that I have acid traumatic. reflux. Oh my God. <laughs> well, it's episode 20. Nick. Hello. Are you ready to drink cocktails and talk about poison? I think we probably should. Or? Give the people what they want. Drink poison and talk about cocktails. That could also be what they want at the moment. I don't know. Um. They could be. Well, we'll see how this goes. We'll have yeah, the poison on standby. So it's Nick's story this week. Hooray. Yes. But before we can even begin on this story journey, we are going to need a drink. They're going to need oh, a drink. Yes. It's a sunny afternoon. He has chosen the secret ingredient that will flavor the cocktail that is inspired by the tale that we tell. And yes. Nick, what is the secret ingredient this week? The so ingredient is not that secret. Well, it's secret, but it's... Not that it, whiskey, basically. It was whiskey. <laughs> I don't think it's not. I a, see your brain working there. You, yeah, it's not. It's, 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 it's not. Well, it's it's whiskey. Okay, whiskey. It's just whiskey. It's not abstract. It's not clever. It's just whiskey. <laughs> oh, whiskey! <laughs> Lovely whiskey. Oh, yes. Are good. Everyone has whiskey in the cupboard. Quite. They should have. And this is one of my favouritest cocktails. I love this cocktail. So. <gasps> the favouritest cocktail in the world. And we haven't done many whiskey cocktails because you're not naturally a whiskey not fan, are you? Not naturally a fan. But this one I do like quite a bit. So what are we going to have, Nick? We are going to have a red hook. A red hook. Oh, you have spoken of such a thing. I have. It sounds it's like a nice. comic book character. It's, always, it's Captain Hook's twin brother. The no, I was... <laughs> No, I was thinking of what's the one, the red, the guy from the Marvel Universe, um, who was the red villain Skull. in Red Skull. That's it. Yes, I was thinking Red Skull. You were just thinking of Captain Hook's worst brother. Yeah, <laughs> Captain Hook. Yeah, he was pretty evil as it was. Well, exactly, and he's got a worse brother because his hook is doused in blood or something. <laughs> It was a charming children's story. It was. A it was. <laughs> this was the sequel that uh, shockingly did not get published. So a red hook, amazing. Yep. So you have uh, provided the ingredients uh, as well. Uh, hey, still in sort of isolation. So we must go to our isolation kitchens and shake up a storm. See you in a minute. See you in a bit. And 
And we're back. Yeah, hello. So, Nick, a red hook we have. It's very classy. Mmm, yeah, I've got it in my uh, Waterford Crystal whiskey glass, and I'm feeling pretty damn sophisticated right now. <laughs> I haven't tasted it yet, but, ooh, lovely. Talk us through it. Uh, well, we have, hands up, the recipe generally calls for whiskey. I'm not being a huge whiskey fan. I've actually used bourbon. <gasps> Philistine. Um, because uh, I prefer it, but it's got, so yeah, whiskey or bourbon mm-hmm. and red vermouth. Ooh. And then a maraschino liqueur, so a cherry. Cherry. Do you like a cherry liqueur? So, and that's it. So it is pure, wow. pure booze. It is, Just yes. St- stirred over rice. Okay, I'm um, very glad it's not my story this week. <laughs> <laughs> So not even the, the shaking to dilute it a lot. It's just giving it a good stir to, to chill it. Um, and I used um, I used Irish whiskey. I used the Black Bush that we used in the last whiskey cocktail we did, which is aged in the sherry and bourbon cast. So it's got a nice uh, flavour to it. So obviously it's not peaty and scotchy. But yay. All right, then. So let's dive into this Red Hook. One of Nick's favourites, guys. Let's it go. is one of my favourites. Oh, well, hello. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, hello, boys. <laughs> It's I, I like that a lot. Yeah, really it works good. as a whiskey cocktail. Yeah, full disclosure, everyone. I, as I've said, I had a horrible attack of acid stomach before <laughs> just before starting. I did a huge shot of Gaviscon. Um, <laughs> so I don't know That's what gonna... is going to happen. <laughs> well, this could be an interesting episode. <laughs> Generally, quite glad we are doing this remotely at the moment. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's going to help. But it's enough delicious... about your stomach. <laughs> It's a delicious cocktail, yeah. They, it's a good uh, cocktail. If you're not a whiskey fan, which you want, then having that sweetness of the vermouth and the maraschino in there is lovely. Ooh, and second sip, second sip. I would heartily recommend anyone who likes cocktails, get a bottle of maraschino cherry liqueur. It's not horrendously expensive. You can get it on Amazon for about £20, mm. 70 centilitre bottle. It is well worth it. Especially if you like your gin cocktails. Um, it is used in so many gin cocktails and... A couple of whiskey ones. The Red Hook is definitely, um, I feel like that's an end of an evening or a quiet kind of in, in wingback leather chair sitting, putting the world's rights cocktails. It's not a I mean, hen night, let's go out and get completely... You say, you say that, I have got... Huh, let me tell you a tale. Um, <laughs> that is just, the point of this podcast, yes. <laughs> just when lockdown started mm-hmm. and everyone was going mad on Zoom conferences and Zoom chats and things like that, yeah. we had one with about with myself and Sinead and a few other friends and I was drinking these and I got through about six of these <laughs> and I was plastered <laughs> yes, absolutely <you> battered <laughs> at the end of it um, and I had to excuse myself I go to sleep I think you did um, you just disappeared at one point I, I go to bed I didn't know you'd had that many <laughs> that was because I've had all of these cocktails most cocktails most of the cocktails we make will get you hammered if you have like two or three of them you will be drunk because we don't mess about with the with the long diluted ones pina colada that we had last week yeah maybe you could have a, a few, few like more that. Those, but. but most of ours they are serious ones so <laughs> yes you will get drunk on it but i don't think it's I, I can't really imagine kind of going out and starting like tracy's getting married red hooks for all please <laughs> no they are two rather separate situations exactly no very much leather yeah leather wingback chair or sit um oh yeah actually on a nice summer evening in front of a fire pit this just classes it up all the way I'm I'm yep. converted. It's not normally yeah. my cup of tea, but I, I quite really like good. this. Yay, yay. And I'm going to enjoy drinking it while you're telling me a story. So, yeah. we have our red hooks firmly in hand. We're hooked. Hey! Whiskey was a secret ingredient. Are you going to tell us a story? Well, I am going to tell you a story. Oh, thank God. Today, we have the tale of Michael Malloy. Michael Malloy. Iron Mike. Mike the Durable. The man who would not die. Wow. So, picture the scene, if you will. Okay. We're in New York City. It's 1932. Prohibition has the US in its grip. The Great Depression rages outside and three men sit in a grim Bronx speakeasy. Okay. (laughs) I'm so So excited. (laughs) (laughs) We have Tony Marino, who owns the bar, um, sits with Francis Pasqua and Daniel Kreisberg, uh, nursing their drinks and complaining about how tough life is, how scarce the next job was, and how the bills keep rolling in. At the other end of the bar sits the sloping and hunched figure of Mike Malloy, a glass of whiskey never far from his mouth. Nice. No one knew much about Mike, not even Malloy himself, other than that he had come from Ireland. What? He had no friends or family. He did not. He had no definitive date of birth. He had no trade or vocation. 
beyond the occasional odd job sweeping alleys or collecting garbage, mm. for which he would mainly be happy to be paid in alcohol instead of money. F- fair enough. He was, wrote the Daily Mirror, just part of the flotsam and jetsam in the swift current of the underworld's speakeasy life. Ooh. Those no longer responsible derelicts who tumble through the last days of their lives in the continual haze of Bowery smoke. <laughs> oh, I love this. This is this is a proper novel starting. Yeah, I'm glad I have the red hook settling back in the chair now. Also, you said that no one knew much about him, including Malloy himself. Malloy didn't know who he was. Well, he didn't know his background. He knew that he what? he was. He knew he had Irish ancestry, but he didn't know his date of birth. What? He had no. He had no family. He had boy. Well, his parents were probably long long deceased, but he didn't know his parents. He had no siblings. He had no family of his own. Ooh, bloody hell! Didn't know where he was from. He was. Oh right. Yeah, okay. He was a relative unknown. A shadow, if you will. Well, quite. Francis Pasqua eyes Malloy from across the bar, and a plan begins to form. Why don't you take out insurance on Malloy? We can take care of the rest. Now, Daniel, Daniel Kreisberg is sitting there. He's thinking his friend is, he's joking. He's had one too many. But Marino, he pauses because Pasqua knew that Marino had pulled off a similar scheme just the year before. It's a classic. It's a classic. I mean, the year before, Marino had befriended a homeless woman named Mabel Carson, probably letting her take shelter in his speakeasy Mm -hmm. and maybe being rather generous with the drinks. Nice. He was able to take out a $2,000 life insurance policy on her, naming him as beneficiary. And then one cold and wet night, she drank herself into unconsciousness. Marino doused the mattress and sheets with water. (sighs) Oh. Push a bed underneath the open window and dumps Mabel naked, shivering and unconscious on the soaked mattress. Oh, that's horrible. The medical examiner lists her death as bronchial pneumonia. Oh. And Marino collects the money without question. Oh, that's ho- That's cold. Literally. That harsh. Yeah, I thought you were going to say he was dousing her mattress in, in petrol or something that he was going to set it on fire. He just he just gets her so drunk. And then she, she freezes to death. Oh, and she freezes to death in a bitter New York winter. Um, poor people but as each round of drinks are poured that evening a plot is conceived Mm. i mean how difficult could it be to push mike to drink himself to death (laughs) every morning for years the old man has shown up at marino's and hours later he would pass out on the floor for a while marino had let him drink on credit but he had stopped paying his tabs and business the bartender confided to his mates was bad so that he's he's becoming more of a liability to them now is he because he's not he's not well, paying yeah, his he's, there, he's, he's not paying his bills and he is just a complete unknown to anyone no one's saying he's got no family seems no perfect one's doesn't miss it him if he goes missing let's see if we can make how let's see how drunk we can get an irishman mm. <laughs> i mean pasca offers to do the legwork for this scam and pays an unnamed acquaintance to accompany him to meetings with insurance agents so this acquaintance calls himself Nicholas Mellory okay. and gives his occupation as a florist. Okay. But it takes Pasca five months and a connection with a fairly dodgy insurance agent to secure three policies, all offering double indemnity mm. on Nicholas Mellory's life. Right. Now, Pasca recruits Joseph Murphy, who is a bartender at Marino's, to identify the the planned soon-to-be-deceased Mike <laughs> as Nicholas Mellory and claim to be his next of kin and the beneficiary of these policies. The plan is laid. But if all goes to plan, the murder trust, as the press would come to call them, would split, in today's money, about $54,000. Mm. I've, heard, I've heard of more. I, I, I have also heard large, large numbers, yes. No. Um, <laughs> Yes, I can think of a bigger number than that. <laughs> I think in our insurance uh, fraud murder cases that we've looked at in the past, uh, it's not it's not a bad amount. You know, I think we've seen more. You know, we've had more impressive ones. Oh, we, we, we certainly have. But this is for but this is for a no one. They want to go under the radar. They're not saying this is the Earl of New York. He's worth twelve billion pounds or dollars or whatever. And probably, oh, someone might know. Someone might recognise him. That is that is true. The Earl of New York is very, very well known. He's, to all. he's very famous. <laughs> he parades the streets going, it's all mine, you know. Okay, yeah, under the radar, a, a, a normal amount. People aren't going to investigate it. No, I like it. Okay, you've converted me. I'm, I'm writing all this down. I'm, I'm glad you're taking notes. So one cold night in December 1932, the gang gather at the speakeasy to set in motion their evil, evil plan. 
<laughs> to now, to Malloy's absolute delight, Tony Marino grants him an open-ended tab. Oh, always question that. He says competition from the other saloons has forced him to ease up on the on the rules. But I really doubt that Mike cares that much as to why. Um, <laughs> He's already just drinking three whiskeys and going, so you see, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care, exactly. I mean, no sooner did he down a shot than Marino refills his glass. I mean, Malloy had been a hard drinker all his life and he drank on and on and on until Marino's arm grows tired from holding the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> but remarkably, a shit Norman. his breathing remains steady. His skin retains its normal ruddy tinge. <laughs> Finally, he drags a grubby sleeve across his mouth, thanks his host for the hospitality, and stumbles out the door, saying he'll be back soon. Right. <laughs> that wasn't the plan. He was supposed to fall over or something by now. <laughs> Malloy follows this pattern for three days. Right. Pausing only long enough to eat a complimentary sandwich. <laughs> Marino and his accomplices are at a loss. Sorry, when, where did the complimentary sandwich come from? Well, no, they're going well. Well, I think probably they want to they want to keep him in the bar. They want to keep topping him up with liquor, so they say you don't have to go out and get something to eat. Have a sandwich. <coughs> Stay there. Keep keep drinking. I love the fact that they're in the back. They're clearly good. Get him a sandwich. It was a sardine sandwich. Oh fuck off! What? No. That is that is a real that is a desperate sandwich. That's a desperate. <laughs> sa There's people going. Okay, we need to feed this guy. Whatever we got, sardines. Put them in bread. <laughs> It almost became the secret ingredient, but I thought a sardine cocktail would be a step too far. Yeah, I think that I think that would be all round. <laughs> oh, Malloy is in a oh god, he's just standing there drinking whatever he's drinking and 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 having sardine sandwiches. He's a sexy, sexy man. <laughs> oh yes. Imagine all the ladies are flocking up to him. <laughs> I mean, we're now on day day four, Not and the problem is that the. That the guys they they haven't done this too often before. They're they're not great at, at this planning malarkey. And the number of people who know about this scheme is starting to grow. Oh. Other other patrons in the bar are wondering, well, why the hell is Malloy suddenly getting all this free free drinks? There there's this nobody, this homeless bum who lives on the streets. So more and more people are being brought into the fold of this this scam. The end pot is being dwindled by this. Yeah, a few other regulars, including with some excellently named petty criminals. Oh, good. Okay. We've got we've got John McNally. John McNally. Edward Tinier Smith. Edward Tinier Smith. <laughs> whose whose artificial ear was actually made out of wax, not tin. What? <laughs> he had a he had a fake ear. He had a fake ear. Ugh. So these are all sort of petty criminals, sort of probably slightly. I say gangster might be a bit too bit too fancy for them we've got tough tony backstone tough tony backstone <laughs> tough tony tough tony and his and his sidekick joseph maglioni nice on on day four malloy stumbles back into the bar and boy he explains ain't i got a thirst now tough tony is getting impatient at this point i mean he is he suggests we shoot him in the head <laughs> that'll do it there we go. I mean, Tough Tony is not called Tough Tony for no reason. Yeah. Um, he's, uh, he's not a subtle man. They're trying to wrestle a gun out of his hand at the back. Why did we bring Tough Tony into this? All he does is shoot people. Yeah. He just shoots people. But Murphy, the bartender, mm. recommends a more subtle solution. Right. And they exchange Malloy's whiskey and his gin with shots of wood alcohol. Oh, wow. Okay. So wood alcohol, another name for methanol. Mm. Um, it was sometimes used during, during Prohibition as a substitute for the more hard-to-find normal alcohol, ethanol. But methanol was easily available. It was produced in huge quantities for industry, mainly as a paint stripper. <laughs> Drinks containing just 4% wood alcohol could cause blindness. <laughs> From the start of Prohibition in 1920 to 1929... More than 50,000 people throughout the United States had died from the effects of impure alcohol. Oh, good God. And that's the adulteration with primarily wood alcohol. Um, 50,000 people in nine years. That desperate for a drink. Potentially, I know where they're coming from. Um, <laughs> but they're, they're not serving Malloy shots tainted with wood alcohol. They are serving him neat wood alcohol. He's Irish. Pure. He can handle it. 100%. But Pochine so runs through his this... veins. <laughs> <laughs> Marino thinks this is a brilliant plan. I mean, he he declares he will give him all the drink he wants and let him drink himself to death. Good God! So he goes. Murphy goes and buys a few ten cent cans of wood alcohol at a nearby paint shop. Carries them back in a brown paper bag, and he serves Malloy 
Well, first of all, a few shots of cheap whiskey to get him feeling good. Warm him up. And then he makes the switch. The gang watch in probably terror and probably slightly impressed as Malloy downs shot after shot and keep asking for more. What? He, he displays no physical symptoms. I mean, other than those of being completely ravenous. <laughs> I mean, the New York Evening Post report, he didn't know that what he was drinking was wood alcohol. And what he didn't know, apparently didn't hurt him. <laughs> he drank all the wood alcohol he was given and came back for more. Fair <laughs> enough. The thing is, it's, it, I think we've all been there. Not this, literally. Go with me. Um, <laughs> so, really? Well, you know, it's late and the bleach is there. Um, but you know when you have, a, you have that first drink or you have, you know, the first drink of the evening, sometimes even like this cocktail that we're drinking now, you go, whoo! oh god that's strong oh we're gonna go easy on that but the second or third <laughs> sip suddenly it mellows and everything's fine yeah, and then absolutely. after two or three cocktails you'll drink anything and that's when that you can feel you feel no pain exactly and that's that when the the jaeger bombs come out and that's where the crazy cocktails because you it doesn't touch the sides you feel no pain so you kind of that's oh, where you, you make you the crazier suggestions just white <laughs> <laughs> i mean <laughs> I mean, the effects of methanol poisoning I mean, do take time to appear. I mean, sometimes up to 30 hours. So it wouldn't have been immediately obvious. I mean, methanol is broken down by enzymes in the liver. First, converted to formaldehyde, which is then converted into formic acid. Ooh. Now, neither of those are known for their health benefits. Formic acid damages an optic nerve, which causes the blindness. But Iron Mike isn't your average person. <laughs> Clearly not. N- night after night, the scene is repeated with Molloy drinking shots of wood alcohol as fast as Murphy pours them. One night, he crumples without warning to the floor. <gasps> the gang fall silent. I mean, has this finally worked? They stare at this heap on the floor. I mean, Pasca goes over and kneels by Molloy's body, feeling the neck for a pulse and then lowering his ear to his mouth to listen for breathing. The man's breath is slow and laboured, but they decide to wait, see what's going to happen. They watch the struggling rise and fall of his chest. Any minute now, it would be over. Finally, there was a long, drawn-out, jagged breath, and then a huge snore from Malloy (laughs) as he passes out. Snoring away on the floor of this pub. Hours later, he wakes, rubs his eyes. Give me some of the old regular, my lad, he says. <laughs> I am officially in love with this man. <laughs> Give us some of the old regular, my friend. <laughs> oh I mean, this, this, this plot to kill Malloy is becoming really expensive. <laughs> I mean, the open bar, the, the the cans of wood alcohol, not to mention the monthly insurance premiums they're having to pay. Of course, yes. And it all adds up. I mean, Marino is really panicked that his speakeasy is going to go bankrupt um, from this plan. <laughs> and like now every customer in there is in on it as well because they can't oh, yeah, drink pretty anything much. <laughs> because Malloy is drinking all of it and they're all sitting there going, yeah. Where, when will this man die? <laughs> I mean, tough Tony once again... He suggests his brute force. Let's just shoot him in the head. But no, Tough Tony, <laughs> oh, love, calm it down. I love Tough Tony. He's sitting there with a gun and a baseball bat it really and is. a breeze block. <laughs> He's just Let sitting me there polishing him. his gun. <laughs> come, come on, I can do this. <laughs> but Pasca has another idea. Oh, God. Malloy has a taste for seafood. His sardine sandwiches. Okay. So why not drop some oysters in denatured alcohol so ever ever so tasty methylated spirits. <laughs> Let them soak for a few days. Really gather yes, up all that flavour. <laughs> and then serve them to Malloy while he's enjoying his wood alcohol shots. Malloy has good taste. You know, he's, Malloy has excellent taste. Exactly. Take. Oysters for me. <laughs> alcohol taken during a meal of oysters, Pasca theorised, will almost invariably cause acute indigestion for the oysters remain preserved in the alcohol preserved in the stomach and are going to cause you all sorts of unpleasantness yeah i mean as planned malloy eats them one by one savoring each one washing them down with shots of wood alcohol pasca and the rest play cards and wait malloy merely licks his fingers and belches (laughs) so so he's been downing shots of whiskey downing shots of wood alcohol paint stripper yep then been served oysters which have been soaked in 
methylated spirits. And he's just licking his fingers. Mm, delectable. Mm, tasted delectable. <laughs> Absolutely. What a lovely snack to accompany my fine beverages. You know what? I, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to a dozen oysters or half a dozen or half a dozen oysters. Let's not be ostentatious. Yeah, but usually with a nice chilled rosé. <laughs> not a can of meth. I mean, he's not planning. He's not pairing he's the drinks snack. with the food appropriately. But, you know, power to him. <laughs> so at this point, killing Michael Malloy was just about, was just as much a matter of pride than it was about the money. <laughs> um, I mean, money they all gripe that we would be split amongst an ever increasing number of conspirators. So Bartender Murphy tries again next. He left a tin of sardines out to rot for several days. Takes his rotten sardines, uh... mixes in some tasty carpet tacks what and shavings of the sardine tin itself what? slathers this delightful concoction between pieces of bread and serves Malloy the sandwiches and we know Malloy's fondness for seafood and sardine sandwiches any minute they thought the metal is going to start slashing through his insides instead Malloy finishes his tin sandwich and asks for another what <laughs> the man is a machine I mean, he is. I mean, the gang call an emergency meeting. They don't know what the hell is going on with Mike Malloy. He had become the Rasputin of the Bronx. Nice. Um, Marino then remembered his previous success with Mabel Carlson and suggests that they ice Malloy down and leave him outside overnight. So that evening, Marino and Pasca toss the drunk Malloy into the back seat of Pasca's roadster. They drive in silence to Crotona Park and lug this unconscious man through heaps of snow. After depositing him on a park bench, they strip off his shirt and dump no. bottles of water over him, over his chest and his head. Malloy never stirs. Okay. When Marino arrives at his speakeasy the following day, he finds Malloy's half-frozen form in the basement. What? Somehow Malloy had woken, trekked half a mile back, and persuaded the bartender Murphy to let him in. When he what? came to, he... He complained of a wee chill. <laughs> See, he had his booze jacket on. <laughs> yeah, he completely you, you, did. You can strip a man down, you can douse him with water, you ain't going to cut through the booze jacket. <laughs> oh my God, is he a zombie now? Is this what this is? <laughs> I mean, February nears and another insurance, insurance payment is, is coming up. One of the gang, John McNally, wanted to run Malloy over with a car. But... <laughs> Tinia Smith is sceptical. Nothing else has worked. Why the hell is this going to work? But <laughs> Marino, Pasca and Murphy, Kreisberg, they're, they're intrigued and desperate. Yeah. And John Maglioni, one of the, the more quieter partners of the conspiracy, offers the services of a cab driver friend of his named Harry Green. They all pile into Green's cab, a drunken Malloy once again strewn across their feet. Uh, Green drives a few blocks and stops. Backstone and Murphy, tough Tony Backstone and Murphy, nice. drag Malloy down the road, holding him up. So each one on an, one arm, and he's sort of like held in a sort of crucifix sort of position Aww. with one guy on each arm. And Green guns the engine. Everyone braces. But from the corner of his eye, Maglioni sees a quick flash of light and he yells, Stop! The cab screeches to a halt. But then Green decides it had just been someone turning on a light switch in a house. Right. Nearby. Oh, he thought it was the cops or something. <laughs> they thought it was the cops. They thought it was another car's headlight coming around the corner. That's the point where there would be an ad break, wouldn't it? Yeah. And yes. they'd be like, oh, <laughs> cliffhanger. But no, it was, it was just someone turning on the light switch in a room. So Green, he's there and he prepares for another go. Mm. Malloy manages to struggle and leap out of the way. Not once, but twice. What? So they're just driving at him on the street. Him, they're just yeah, playing driving chicken. at him on the street. Um, but twice now he has managed to sort of see what's going on and stumble out of the way. And um, the car's missed him. He has drunk everything in New York. He's eaten all of the seafood. He's eaten thumbtacks and bits of metal. He's been half frozen. And yet he's still managing to be quicker than a car. Yeah, apparently so. I mean, on the third attempt... Green races towards Malloy at 50 miles an hour. Maglione is sitting in the back of the car, watching through like through his fingers. <laughs> Two thuds. The body hits the, the bonnet, the hood of the car, 
and then bounces over and drops to the ground. For good measure, Green backs up <sighs> over him. The gang is confident that this must be the end of Malloy, but a passing car scares them away, and they before they can check, they have to run. Malloy is left in a heap in the middle of the road. It now falls to Joseph Murphy, the bartender, who has been cast as Nicholas Mallory's brother, to call the morgues, call the hospital. What's going on with my dear brother? He's missing. <laughs> uh, where is he? Uh, I'm so very, very worried. Did he say it in that tone of voice as well? <laughs> where is my brother? I'm so very, very worried. Where is he? Please. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. God, why? <laughs> but, I mean, no, no one has any information. Um, nor are there reports in the papers of any fatal accidents. Ooh. Five days later, no one has heard anything about Malloy. And in, in the speakeasy, as Pasca sits there plotting to kill another homeless drunk and pass him off as Nicholas Mallory, the door to Marino's speakeasy <laughs> swings open and in limps a battered, bandaged Michael Malloy <laughs> with a fractured skull and a broken shoulder. He only looks slightly worse than usual. <laughs> and what a story he has to tell. I mean, what he can remember of it. He recalls the taste of whiskey, of the cold night air, and the glare of rushing lights. Then nothing. Next thing he knows, he's waking up in a warm bed at Fordham Hospital with multiple broken bones and only wanting to get back to his friends at the bar. Oh, oh that's... That is hilarious, but heartbreaking. But heartbreaking. <laughs> you can imagine if he walks in, everyone in that bar just goes, for fuck's sake, will this for man not sake. die? Oh, what God. What is going on? There, there are many people that I know, uh, there's no beating around the bush. All of my family were the first thing you would do after an, an accident or any kind of injury. You're straight to the pub. You're straight to the bar. Absolutely. Went, oh, I've tell, tell you, I've tell, tell you. There we are. No, I need a <laughs> drink in my hand before I can talk about this. But yeah, he thinks, oh, he thinks they're his friends. Absolutely. I mean, they've been so generous to him. He has him. no family. All this alcohol that they've been giving him because, oh, oh, because no, he's sad. by himself. And it's, it is a, it's a heartbreaking thing. He's, he, he doesn't have any family. He doesn't have any past. He's just been lavished with what he thinks is kind attention by people. Yeah. Been given drinks because he's worked so hard. He's an owl fella who's... Aww. He is the true Earl of New York. <laughs> Please let that be the end of the story. <laughs> no. <laughs> cover the, the babies were switched at birth. <laughs> I mean, the gang consider hiring a professional hitman, but it was just it was just too expensive. I mean, they, if they did that, there'd be nothing left. Can they not do any, any of, of this shit? Like, t tough Tony at the back is like, play me. I can <laughs> shoot him in the face. But then you've got to cover your tracks, haven't you? You've got to, because you've got to cover your the tracks. Money. They're probably blah, blah, thinking, blah, blah. tough Tony, you're not a subtle man. So let's... <laughs> so, yes, tough Tony, you've proven nothing by your name. <laughs> and again, in the Great Depression, depression, a lot of insurance claims. We know from the Philadelphia poisoning ring, people trying to run people over thinking it's a really good idea. And clearly it does not work. I mean, you say it does not work. They try to run over another homeless man. So they can cash in their policies, but he also survives. It doesn't work. These people are it's shit running drivers. over people, <laughs> or, or potentially that. They, <laughs> so they on... have clearly never played the game Carmageddon. <laughs> <laughs> on February the twenty first, nineteen thirty three, seven months after the murder trust first convened, oh Michael God. Malloy finally <gasps> succumbs to the gang's plan. In a tenement near 168th Street, less than a mile from Marino Speakeasy, mm. Mike Malloy lies on a bed. A rubber tube runs from a gas light into his mouth. What? And a towel is wrapped tightly around his face. Oh! And they, at long last, have got him through carbon monoxide poisoning. Oh, the poison. Oh, so. well, mm, alcohol and also... I mean, there, there have been many, many, many poisons. Many, everything. Is that carbon monoxide poisoning. God. Dr. Frank Manzella, who is a friend of Pascas, files a phony death certificate. No doubt he also is now in for a share of this ever dwindling amount of money that they're hoping to get. I mean, he fills in a phony certificate, death certificate in the name of Nicholas Mellory, citing Lobar pneumonia as the cause really yeah after monoxide poisoning he's a homeless man he's a drunk a doctor has signed a certificate saying this is how he's died 
who is really going to question it? True, fair enough. No one's yeah, he's, no he's, one's looking at the body, are they? Because exactly. monoxide no poisoning, looking... it's pretty damn obvious if you die from monoxide poisoning. But yeah, okay. yeah, I keep, I keep I keep thinking that people care. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, in this one, I mean, there is no one to care in this one, which is precisely the reason they chose this okay. chat. Oh. The gang are able to collect on one of the three life insurance policies and they receive $800 from Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. This is $800 back in the 20s. Back in the day. Early 30s. But Murphy and Marino each spend their share on a new suit. Oh, for God's sharp. sake. They've got to look good. They've got to oh. look good. That, that, get, he runs a speed Materialism, you know, if you're going to be murdering for money... What else do you murder for? They've done such a bad job. They're not thinking about the bigger scheme of things. Like, oh, we got some money. Can I get a new suit? For God's sake. <laughs> got a new suit. New exactly. suit. That's the most important thing for everyone to con- so convince that's... people that we're not murderers. <laughs> if we have a shiny new suit, they can't be that. Well, he's got the suit going for him. <laughs> Bloody hell. Pasca arrives at the Prudential office, confident that he's going to collect the money on the other two remaining policies. But the agent surprises him with a question. When can I see the body? <gasps> I mean, Pasca replies that I mean he's already buried. His brother Joseph wanted him buried as quickly as possible, but the insurance company are immediately suspicious. I don't necessarily think suspicious, but just looking for any reason not to pay out. Um, and I, I can't see the body. Then, nap, no dice. They notify the police. Do 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 do. And the investigation ensues, <laughs> and the conspiracy soon unravels. <laughs> Malloy's body is exhumed. And after the autopsy, it is clear that the cause of death was not low bar pneumonia, as had been claimed, but was monoxide poisoning, carbon monoxide poisoning. It's interesting that they were able to reach that conclusion, given that his stomach must have been a treasure trove of bits of metal and thumbtacks and various forms of alcohol, (laughs) and his liver would have just been a horror story. I mean, probably, probably his liver and stuff, they would have thought, he's a homeless drunk. Oh, we will be taking whatever alcohol that he can get. Yeah, exactly. He's <laughs> taken whatever. I mean, it wasn't uncommon for, I mean, it's not uncommon now for people who are that desperate for a fix to go for, for methylated spirits or paint stripper and stuff like that, if you're that desperate. I, I think it's more that the, all the metal and the pins in his stomach that they fed him in the sardine things. Whatever it was, they realised that his death was not as recorded they start this investigation they start questioning talking to people people know that he is a regular at malloy's the police go there they start talking they start asking questions green henry green the cab driver turns out he's not too happy with his cut and he starts talking Uh, they they are willing to offer him well exactly they're not willing to pay him more to keep his mouth shut Ooh, foolish the police also uncover the suspicious death of mabel two years previous yay the homeless woman that marino had benefited from before justice for mabel justice, justice for mabel justice for mabel they're not well, good actually... mobsters are they i mean no, but they're not mobsters they're not at all they they are petty criminals yeah they're, they're not thinking things through properly and they don't have the money or the mouth or the reputation to back up saying you don't talk we can get this airtight yeah. and they can't pay Absolutely. off the cops either <laughs> yeah exactly and a completely unrelated incident tough tony is shot dead <laughs> in a completely non Mike Malloy related situation. Did he he's shoot himself? Well, potentially. He's got, I've got to he shoot was... someone. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to shoot someone. Obviously, I mean, obviously, his desire to shoot people. He's been focused on the wrong people who shot him first. <laughs> Before long, there is enough evidence to arrest the remaining murder trust. They appear first at the Bronx County Courthouse. At the beginning, they try to plead insanity. I mean, how that works, I have no idea. Oh, collective insanity. Collective insanity between the four of them. I, I could I could get on board with that because they probably were, some of them were going forward saying, we thought we could kill this man. Clearly, we were insane. We were insane <laughs> yes. to do this in the first place. It's been seven months of our lives. My wife has left me. I My bar is empty. <laughs> <laughs> I have grey hairs in places that I should not have grey hairs. Why do we ever try? That surprisingly doesn't work. And then they try to implicate each other. Nice. They try to nice. blame Turn everyone. On they each try other. to blame each other. It was his idea. He forced me to do it. That also <laughs> doesn't particularly fly. They know. They've got people. They've got witnesses. Finally, they try and accuse the the already dead 
Tony. Tough Tony. Tough Tony. Of Malloy's murder. It, it was all Tough Tony's idea. It was, it was all, all Tough his... Tony's idea. He had his, he wet his beak in everything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> tough Tony the psycho. But, but Tough Tony always favoured the gun. <laughs> Indeed. Tough Tony's dead. So what a convenient <laughs> person to blame. None of it works. Frank Pasca, Tony Marino, Daniel Kreisberg and Joseph Murphy were tried and convicted of first degree murder. The founding members of the Murder Trust are sent to Old Sparky. Old Sparky, really? The electric chair in Sing Sing. Which unsurprisingly kills them all on the very first time. (laughs) It does the trick first time around. Because we can imagine Malloy being in that chair going, oh, there's a faint tickle there. I haven't got all day. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yes. But no, the four of them, it does it quite, quite nicely. And that is the story of Mike Malloy. Who, from a humble nobody, has become immortal as the immortal Mike Malloy. The immortal Mike Malloy. What a tale. Oh, my God. Yes. Yes to all of that. It's a good story. I like that It is a good story. story. I was, full disclosure, during that, I was in my head very clearly picturing some of those characters as characters from the simpsons and also futurama <laughs> so 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 tony tough tony was definitely clamps from uh, from from futurama the clamps <laughs> use the clamps yep <laughs> marino is 100 percent fat tony from the simpsons oh absolutely. i told yeah. you we should have bought more, more than three bullets yeah exactly I, I, right. it's amazing that i go to the simpsons rather than the godfather <laughs> but still what a legend mike malloy is and such characters all the way uh, through that. It, 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 it totally feels like a film or a book. I'm so surprised it hasn't been, well, it may have, may have been, I don't know about it, but it hasn't been Maybe. made into a film or something like that. How could you do it, though? Because would you make it funny or would you make it serious? Well, you, you, <laughs> mean, you, would, you would have to do it in a slightly humorous way, I think, because it is just so ridiculous. Because to, to do it seriously, I mean, it's, it is... It is unbelievable in its mm. in what he went through and what he did and how he just bounced back from every single thing. <laughs> but there is a part of me, there is a core part of me, and any of my relatives who are listening are all going, ah, because he was Irish. Exactly right. If he wasn't Irish, <laughs> this would not be a story. Oh, if he wasn't Irish, he'd be dead within the first day. The pride in just the sheer amount you can drink and you don't pass out and you don't walk away <laughs> from a free tab. If there is free drink, you drink it. You do not go to sleep with drink in the house. <laughs> yeah, it, it, we're made of tough stock. I'm, I'm trying to picture him a lawyer as well because like, if, he's a, if he's a big fella, if he's... Was he? Do we know what he looked I mean, like? The only picture I found, which is not, okay, not a happy thing to end on, but the only picture I found of him was his autopsy photo. Um, Aww. So, okay. Well, where, that's nice. But he, no, he's, he's, not a, he's not a big chap. It's like a headshot of him, and he certainly doesn't appear to be a chubby guy. But if he was poor as well, like, he can't be having big meals No, in, well, indeed. So, I mean, there was one thing that I read when he was a younger man. He was a firefighter. Ah. Um, okay you have to be pretty fit for that exactly you You have to you have to be fit and you have to be strong and you have to be yeah healthy but that was that was only one account that made that claim so if that's true or not i don't know i can imagine there's a lot of claims about malloy kind of like he had a shock of hair red as the fires of hell (laughs) (laughs) arms like tree trunks he did (laughs) and if any if this story has told us nothing else alcohol the greatest poison of them all you you say that while i have a drink so you you have entitled to a drink Nick you've talked for a long time and it's been great it was a couple of things I was thinking during it when they said they served him the wood alcohol but they didn't tell him what it was there's that slight idea of the like the placebo effect when you're told something is really really strong you act more drunk you sort of your, your, your muscles relax I don't know whether it's your muscles relax but it's the the placebo effect is a real thing oh for sure so it if is. you're told something will cure you then you feel better. Is it the same thing with not knowing? No, I, I don't think that's the case because it's going to do it's going to do stuff chemically inside, which is whether you believe it or not is going to happen. Um, well, like two shots, maybe if he's been drinking it for four days, as he clearly was. But, but how but certainly, he if you think you say that that's just normal whiskey, you're not going to know the difference, sort of thing. I mean, it's like when when we start out, you start out on the nice wine, the first <laughs> bottle of wine, that's the fancy wine. After that's the good that's wine. That's the good wine. The good wine. After you've drunk the good <laughs> wine, fuck knows what you're drinking. It, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> that could be pain stripper, but it's but it's all good. Exactly. Your, your standards drop 
massively in all forms when the drink kicks in. <laughs> Doesn't matter about wine, women, song, everything. <laughs> I think Doro Brian says it brilliantly, is saying that when he's drinking and he's writing, the first glass gets you going, the second glass, the words are flowing, the words are flowing. The third glass, uh, I long for the days of the second glass. <laughs> yes. yeah, absolutely. I mean, but there, 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 there must have been something about Mike that let him survive that punishment. It's not a pure psychological thing. <laughs> it is sad that Mike, that, that no one cared about him. It, I mean, that is, that, that is sad. I mean, he had no idea. But he had the ultimate revenge, I suppose, on that. You've got to think about it like karma, if you believe in that sort of thing. Yeah. And it, it's desperate. It's desperately sad. And obviously he did die and in horrible circumstances. He put up a damn good oh, fight. Oh, God, yeah, absolutely. You know, it wasn't like he had a beautiful life no, around him. Alcohol he had was going to get him sooner or later. And he died in blissful ignorance, didn't he? Well, yes, he died probably quite comfortably. Not in a painful yes. way, eventually, how they got no, him. No, he, he thought he had friends. He thought he had... He did not pay for a drink in seven months. Yeah, well, quite. I mean, <laughs> I mean that's brilliant. To most of us, it'd be like, I can die happy now. That is something to aspire to. <laughs> he died in blissful ignorance. And even though he was no one, he didn't have a past, he now is legend. And he saw all of the, those four guys who orchestrated it all went to the electric chair. Yeah, absolutely. And isn't that incredible? Again, if, like, if you feel like you're a nobody all your life, to be someone whose death meant something. Oh, I mean, his death is discussed on by two drunk people on podcasts a hundred years later. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, what more could you ask Mike, for? <laughs> if you're listening up there, Mike, just know that it meant something. <laughs> And also, they were terrible mobsters. Oh, Let's they were. They were put dreadful. that right up there, right oh, now. But apart from Tough Tony, we, yeah, we do have a soft Tough, Tony. tough Tony. He's just, I want to shoot anyone. <laughs> just let me shoot someone. Yes, and then <laughs> shot himself in the face because he was so frustrated. <laughs> What a story, guys. So episode 20, what do you think about, well, mobsters? T share your stories of how drunk you've gotten and survived. <laughs> yes, that's a good one. But we all have those couple of stories where it defies logic that we drank that much, was so drunk, and then didn't have the hangover. Uh, the cheese and wine incident is always a good one. <laughs> As is the cellar tequila. Um, oh, the cellar tequila <laughs> one. Oh, yes. We should tell you about the cellar tequila at some point. <laughs> we shall tell you this story. We want you to share your stories. Tell us when you have survived an insane amount of drink but another thing is obviously we've got more stories to tell so as it's episode 20 we wanted to share with you that we will be launching patreon in a few days we've talked about it a couple of times but it's happening people we're doing it we would love to bring you more content so that's why we are launching patreon we are going to share all the details on social media on all of the channels if you love us please become a patreon even if you don't love us become a patron as well even if you don't love us yes yes we are fine we are shallow people we'll go, we'll go with that yeah we're, we have no pride exactly if you have <laughs> questions do come and talk to us a very good sample of why patreon is good a lot of you will know this already, real life ghost stories. But aside from all this money talk, let's just drink more cocktails. Because it's episode 20. You know what? We've had, uh, actually, we're not going to lie, it's been a couple of red hooks during this show. And I have to say something to Cockeyed Bastard, who follows us on Instagram. <laughs> you have well and truly out umbrellaed me with your pina colada. It was a spectacular, spectacular cocktail. It was I take my hat off to you. Amazing. It was awesome. Next time, I'm going to win. <laughs> <laughs> We have never seen so many umbrellas. <laughs> and wonderful people who also just shared pictures going, we don't have any of the ingredients, but here's a cocktail. We made a pina colada out of nothing. Well done. Well done, my children. Well, little poisonies. It's been episode 20. <laughs> we will have some extra special content coming out for you on Patreon very soon. Always come and talk to us and tell your friends about the podcast. But we have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye. Bye.